Doris Futoff, and uh, I'm 13 years old. I'm from Redmond, Washington State, and when I was seven, I published my first book. It's called Flying Fingers, Mastery the Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Writing, and it's a book full of short stories and tips on how to write fiction. And my uh, more recent book, it's called Dancing Fingers, it's a book of poetry that I wrote when I was uh, between the ages of nine and ten, actually, because there's a lot of poems in here. And I co-authored it with my sister, Adriana. And so in both of the books, I give tips on... <laughs> <laughs> Looks like both of them say my um, In both the books, I give tips on uh, different writing, different writing styles, and how to write. So uh, it was really natural for me to just start speaking to students about different types of writing. And one thing that I would hear from a lot of people is that they had sometimes difficulty with writing from props or writing on their state tests. So um, I wanted to ask you guys, how do you feel about your state test? Are you a little nervous? Are you? Pretty confident about it, um, and how do you feel about the state, uh, and how do you feel about the prompts? Hey, Brian, how do you feel about it? Yeah, talk about creative Yeah, I think I can hear him. I'm sorry. Did you hear him? I'm not pretty quite nervous. Okay, he said he was pretty nervous. Pretty nervous. Okay, so I'm hoping that for you guys, I'm hoping that that's not too common, that you're not all really like shaking out of your boots. But if, you, if your face looks like this when you think of state prompts, that's a little more of an excited face than a nervous one. But uh, if your face looks like this, then, uh, then I'm hoping that we can hopefully change that because prompts really don't have to be hard. In fact, you can make it very easy. What's the first thing that you do when you see a prompt on your state writing assessment? Okay. Jack, what's the first thing you do? You gotta talk loud so she can hear you. Oh, uh, but you gotta read the prompt. Read the prompt, exactly. That's a pretty good first step would be to read the prompt. Because if you if you don't read the prompt, then you're gonna just start writing, then that might you might not be quite on topic. So what else would you want to do? You read the prompt, then what? Where? Um make a web. You might make a web, that's a great idea. So you Look at the prompt, you have an idea, you want to organize it, you might uh, pre-write, make a web, that's a good thing to do. So while you're reading it, and you may want to reread it as well, have any of you have an experience where you read through a prompt and you're reading through kind of quickly, and you're like, huh? Write it, it's, you don't quite get what they want you to do? Yeah, I see some right hands. And even I've done that, because then you might think, oh, you know, she's a writer, she'd have an easy time with the prompt, but I've read through prompts and I've been like, what? on earth could I possibly say about this? Because I got one recently and it was about uh, do you think summer camp is like a good idea or a bad idea or um, you know, should kids be spending more time with their family or should they be going to summer camp? And so I was like, well, I haven't been to summer camp. I think it's sure it's a good idea, but I mean, I don't have a lot of personal experience. So I thought about this and I was just sort of stuck. And then I realized, oh, well, my sister, she loves summer camp. Um, she, she goes to a piano camp every year. And she always tries to get away from the family when she can. So for some people, you know, that, that like to have new adventures and, and um, get away from their family when they're summer, it was a good idea. So then I took what I knew, even though it wasn't like my own story, I took my sister's and I managed to write an essay in response. So something that you start out with that you're like, oh, this is really difficult, you can usually scrape something together, either from your own experience or from somebody else's and from things that you know, and, and you can make a good response. So tip number one, as we've heard, what is the first thing that you do when you get a prompt, is you read it. So read the prompt carefully, look for keywords, and think about the purpose of the prompt. What do I mean when I say purpose here? Yeah, what does she mean? Purpose. Sixth graders. Sixth graders, come on, what does she mean by purpose of the prompt? Dalton, what do you think she means? Purpose. So, yes, um, if you think about purpose, uh, when you're trying to go somewhere with your family, you're taking a car trip, let's say, then uh, your purpose would be to get to the place, whether it's a restaurant or an amusement park. And when, when you prompt, when you think about a prompt's purpose, you ask, what do they want me to do? What is the topic that they want me to speak about or to respond on? So ask yourself three questions. What is my purpose? Who is my audience? What is my perspective? So, who is your audience when you're writing on a state test? Who's the audience? Guided, who's the audience? Your classroom. I'm sorry? Think about 
He said your classroom. Think again about the state test, though. Do we ever get to read what you wrote on the state test? Who reads what you write on the state test? Caitlin? Mm -hmm. The judges. The judges, yeah, exactly. So your state test, and it's sort of weird to oh. think about this, but when you write when you write down the response on yeah. your state yeah. test, then it goes and it's sent off to a bunch of people who you may not know who are going to be reading your work and giving it a score. So that makes it a little bit challenging because if you know your audience, for instance, if you know that your audience is a bunch of teenage girls in a certain city, then you can then you can write in a certain way that teenage girls like. Or if you know that your audience is a bunch of people at a um, at a retirement home, then you might write again in a way that uh, maybe maybe more elderly people would like. So a lot of authors they have a specific audience in mind. People who write picture books don't really intend picture books to be read by, I don't know, 20 year olds. They intend picture books to be read by probably, uh, you know, younger kids. But when you're writing for a state test and you don't have that kind of guideline because you don't really know, is my audience going to be this age? Are they going to be a man or a woman? Are they going to live here or there? You don't have that. But what you do have is the fact that your audience doesn't know you and you don't know your audience and that gives you uh, and that helps you realize that you need to explain some things more. Then you ask, what is my perspective? Anyone know what perspective means? Josh, what do you think perspective is? How about how you see things? How you see things. Excellent. So if any of you have learned about point of view or perspective, uh, then you know that it's sort of like how, where you stand, how you see things. So what your perspective is, it might be your opinion on the topic. Um, and so, when you ask yourself, what is my purpose in writing this, you have a few different answers. Is my purpose to persuade? If your purpose is to persuade somebody to think the way that you think, that would be persuasive writing. If you're trying to inform or explain, then it would be expository writing. And if you're trying to entertain, or you make someone laugh, or make them cry, or make them um, entertain, then that would be narrative writing. Now, what is the difference? Does anyone want to explain the difference between persuasive writing and expository writing? French, pop up. Persuasion tries to be a I'm sorry? You're almost like yelling and we're like how loud I'm talking so that she can hear, okay? And there's a little bit of a delay, but you gotta talk loud. So say that again loud. Persuasion tries to get someone to do something and expository just talks about how Could you hear him? Yes, that was great, exactly. Um, when you're persuasive, then you're going to be trying to do something, trying to sell something, or trying to uh, sell your own opinion. You're trying to get people to agree with you. So if you've ever seen like advertisements that are trying to get you to buy this new awesome sandwich or the the um, the new things available at your grocery store, you know then you know that those are persuasive. They're trying to get you to buy that. Now when you write a persuasive essay about why you think penguins are the coolest animals on earth, then you're trying to get someone to agree with your opinion. Now, if you were writing an expository essay about penguins, then it would be something like, penguins' natural habitat is Antarctica, penguins don't have wings to fly with, but they make up for it with some skill in swimming. Now, what's the difference between penguins are the coolest birds on Earth because they can do so many things, and penguins live in Antarctica? What is the difference between those two examples? What are the two different, what's the difference, guys, in that style of writing? What's the difference between those two examples? Katie, what do you think? Well, the first statement was an opinion, and the second statement was a uh, fact. Yeah, exactly. In persuasive writing, then you're, you're using your own opinion, and you're trying to support it with things that are hopefully true. And when you're doing expository writing, then your paper is all about the facts. It's informing. It's teaching someone something. So when your teacher is telling you about uh, a specific kind of writing, so for instance, descriptive writing, then she probably doesn't say, well, descriptive writing is just the best kind of writing to do. It is just the most amazing, most fun 
thing ever. You know, you should spend all of your time doing descriptive writing. No, she probably doesn't do that. She would explain, you know, here's how to do descriptive writing, these are a few techniques you use, and that's sort of the difference between persuasive writing and expository writing right there. Now, there's another kind, narrative writing. So if we know that persuasive is penguins are the best kind of animal and expository is penguins of Antarctica, then narrative writing might be something like once upon a time there lived a penguin out in the frozen ice of Antarctica or something like that. So, you know, we see this would be persuasion, more of advertisements, informing or expositories, more of teaching, and narrative is like when you tell a funny story to a friend or when you're reading a book and it's fiction, all those are examples of narrative. So, it, I made a little uh, kind of thing about persuasive, expository, and narrative. So when would you use when would you use narrative, and when would you use expository, and when would you use persuasive? How do you tell? So what she's asking is, when you look at the prompt, how can you tell what you're supposed to be writing? How can you tell if you're supposed to be writing in the persuasive voice, or expository, or in the narrative? Yeah. Um, and then so expository, it'll say explain. Yeah, there are okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and for narrative, because she asked for the So how would you know if it was narrative? Um, tell a time uh, when uh, you went to summer camp. Exactly. This is, this is a good one, because, um, for instance, for the summer camp one, yeah, there's a few different ways. So in my case, it was a persuasive, and I knew it was persuasive because I was supposed to take an opinion, and I was supposed to... Ex um, I was supposed to say, do I think summer ham is a good idea? Do I think summer ham is a bad idea? And support that. Now, if it were expository, I know that it would say something like, explain the history of summer ham or something like that. Um, and for narrative, it would say something like, imagine that, or tell a, tell a story about a time that you went to summer camp or something like that. So it's pretty easy to spot keywords for each one of these. When it's narrative, generally it might be something like imagine a time, tell a story about, tell about a time. For expository, it might be explain about, um, inform, words like that. And for persuasive, it would be what's either your opinion or take a stand or your perspective or what do you think about this. And especially if they give you two different opinions or two different options and you have to take a side, you know that that's um, persuasive. So it's pretty easy to spot these ones to get used to it. And sometimes you might have more than one purpose. For example, when you write an email to a friend, you might have all three purposes. To inform your friend that your parents bought a huge trampoline, to entertain your friend with a story of how you already bounced off the trampoline into the yard, and to persuade your friend to come over to your place after school. So when, when you sit down to write an email or you're chatting with a friend, then you often use these different kinds of styles. And when you have a prompt on a state test, it's generally, you know that it's going to be persuasive, but just because it's persuasive doesn't mean that you can't include some facts. You know? So that would be an example. In fact, you'd want to include facts to support it. So now we're going to practice. Look at each of the following assignments and name the author's main purpose. To explain, to persuade, or to entertain. Write a letter to a friend who is coming to visit your city. What is the number one thing they should see? Pick one attraction and list the reasons why that would be their top pick. So what kind of writing, uh, what would you be asked to do? Are you trying to write persuasively, expository, or narrative? Courtney, what do you think? Um, probably persuasively because um, what, it wants to go over and you have this. Yeah, exactly. He said two pers- Sorry. Um, yeah, that, that happens a lot. Okay, so, and if we look at the prompt, then you realize that there's a few keywords because, you know, you see that what is the number one thing they should see this one attraction and list the reasons why. So, <coughs> sorry. Um, so you have this, this basically persuasive, a persuasive keyword, list the reasons why, because you're trying to move it on. So, next one, write instructions for building a go-kart. Amy, what is it? Be expository. Expository, yeah. So, 
And, and you know that because when you write instructions to building go kart, when you open up a user manual, it's usually not trying to convince you. It's not trying to sell something because you've already bought it. And it's just giving you instructions or it's informing. Now what about this one? Imagine that you've suddenly been pulled back in time. Where are you? Uh, what do you see and how will you get home? Describe your adventure. Gosh, a narrative? Narrative, exactly. So it's it's pretty easy to see. You know, these are, admittedly, these are a little bit more obvious prompts. But even when you get a prompt, like on your state test, that's asking you to, um, to tell about your favorite role model or something like that, you can apply your same techniques. You can, you know whether they want you to persuade, to inform, to tell a story, and that lets you use the appropriate voice and style of writing. When you know your purpose, make each sentence you write work towards your purpose, to inform, to explain, to persuade, or to entertain. Now, when you ask yourself, who is my audience? So we established that it's a bunch of people who you probably don't know and who don't know you. So how is that at all helpful? Well, knowing your audience is important, and when you know your audience, you know what information you need to include in your writing. So, for instance, if you are writing an email to your brother or sister about your mom, you probably wouldn't include everything about your mom, how old she is, what she does for a living, uh, what she looks like. If you're writing an essay about your mom for class, it would be important to provide some of those details because not all of your classmates would know your mom. So, you see how knowing your audience is pretty important. The important thing to remember is that your audience may not know much about you or your life. So it's crucial to introduce each topic and give the reader a context. Even if your audience does know you when you're writing for a test, it's important to explain each topic and uh, who you're talking about. So, for instance, in this example, if you're mentioning your friend Annie for the first time, be sure to introduce her. So if you're just writing something about, I love my neighborhood, um, my, I, I was sitting down and reflecting on how lovely my neighborhood is, Annie rode around the corner on her BMX. Then suddenly the reader's like, wait a second, we've hit a bump here, who's Annie? So instead, you'd want to be talking about your lovely neighborhood and then say, Annie, my friend from down the street, rode around the corner on her BMX. So you see with that one simple thing, my friend from down the street, you quickly explain who she is. Otherwise, we don't know who Annie is. And you might even want to explain what a BMX is. Annie, my friend from down the street, rode around the corner on her small BMX racing bike. Let's practice. How could we make this more clear for our audience? I live in Harrisburg with Tyler, Jesse, Nana, Snowball, and Mom. Every day, I ride to Burke Hills. I sit next to Pacey and Catherine. We are learning about quarks. Mrs. Huxley says I'm a natural. Afterward, I go over to Sasha's. What don't we know here? What are some questions you might have about this? What are some questions you have? Um, Emma, what's a question you have? Um, who is, um, like, Tyler and Jesse and Anna and Snowball? Exactly. Who are all these people? Are these her buddies from college? Are these her family? Are these her uh, people? Are these people that she knows from a retirement community? Are these you know? There's <laughs> there's a lot of possibilities. I mean, we can pick up on the mom, but um, so that's something that we'll definitely need to explain. Another thing we need to explain: Every day I ride to Burke Hills. I sit next to Pacey and Catherine. So we're wondering, what is Burke Hills? Who are Pacey and Catherine? Um, Mrs. Huxley, Sasha, all these people who are just in there with no explanation. So we're going to fix this. Great. We are going to, and I'm going to step over here and start typing. How could we make this more clear for our audience? So what, what should we explain? We should probably explain who those people are. So are they her family? Are they her friends? Who are they? Who are they, guys? Tell them who you're going to put in there. Devin, who would you say? Family? She says family. Okay, so I live in Harrisburg with my family. My brothers, Tyler and Jesse. My grandma. Because Nana is sort of a, you know, another way of saying grandma. And not everyone uses it, so we can just replace with grandma. Uh, my brothers, Tyler and Jesse, my grandma. Do you think Snowball is a person? No. no. The cat. The cat. Okay. Dog. My cat, they said. My cat, Snowball. 
And I've done the snake before, but my snake snowball doesn't really run off the tongue as my cat does. Okay, my cat snowball and my mom. You know when you think of snowball, you think I'm saying white and furry, and the snakes don't really get it. Okay, so I write to Burke Hills. What do you think Burke Hills is? Wait, what do you think Burke Hills is? Okay, she said a city. A city? Okay, so let's take a look at um, this thing. Every day I ride to Burke Hills, I sit next to Pacey and Catherine. We're learning about quarks. So, just because of the next few sentences, do you think it's a city, or do you think it might be something else? Go ahead, say it, Kendra. She said a school. Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, because I've had some people, because the name, you know, it sounds like a city, or it sounds maybe like some kind of, um, amusement park almost, but yeah, it's it's probably a school. Every day I ride to Burke Hills, my school, where I sit next to, who would you sit next to if you had the choice? Your friends, your enemies, who you didn't know that well, go to Casey and Catherine. Asa, Asa, who would you sit next to? Tell her about um, my friends. Okay, next to my friends, Pacey and Catherine. Okay, in class we are learning about quarks. Mrs. Huxley, who would Mrs. Huxley be? Galen? Uh, their teacher? Yep. My teacher says I'm a natural. Okay, I'll keep it smaller. After school I go to Sasha's. Um, who would Sasha be? Uh, Nick, who's Sasha? Uh, your other friend. Okay, my friend Sasha's house. All right, there we go. Now, if you look at this, I live in Harrisburg with my family, my brothers Tyler and Jesse, my grandma, my cat Snowball, and my mom. Every day I ride to Burke Hills, my school, where I sit next to my friends Pacey and Catherine. In class, we are learning about parks. Mrs. Huxley, my teacher, says I'm a natural. After school, I go over to my friend Sasha's house. Now, it's much more clear than this, because now we don't have questions about what is Burke Hills, is it a city, is it a school, Harrisburg, uh, the family, are they family, who are they, who's Mrs. Huxley, who's Sasha. We, we answered all those questions, and the best thing is we didn't have to explain too much. We just put a couple words here and there. So, now on to another topic. Um, but quickly, I wanted to review that. So, just the the idea of writing for your audience would be to explain things, because you may know perfectly well the names of all of your friends, but the person who's grading your state test won't know all of your friends uh, necessarily, and so you want to be sure to explain that. Pre writing. Okay, uh, raise your hand. You use pre writing when you're responding to a state prompt. Can you say that again? I don't sure. think they heard you. Sorry. Uh, raise your hand if you like to use pre-writing when you're organizing your ideas for a state prompt. Uh, okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. Seeing some raised hands, great. So pre-writing is the writing that you do essentially before you start writing writing. It's the where you organize it. So for instance, um, let's say I have a persuasive response that I have to write. Some parents, my prompt is like some parents argue that computer games are detrimental to children's health and take away from time that could be spent studying or uh, playing outside. What do you think about computer games and are they helpful or harmful to kids? So with that prompt I went and I said my main idea is computer games teach kids valuable skills. And then because uh, let's say that you're at the grocery store, or sorry, you're at the a big um, electronic store and you say to your parents, Mom, Dad, I won this computer game and you should get it for me because computer games teach kids valuable skills. And you just end there. Would your parents get the video game for you? No. 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 Okay, so it's obvious that you need to expand out a little further. So you're good, you have a main idea, that's good, but you want to have reasons. So, reason number one would be uh, kids who get on the computer, oops, this is a really hard one. oh, kids who get on the computer to play games get skills that they can use later in life. For instance, many games such as Animal Crossing require kids to develop typing skills, and kids who get on the computer every day to play games will be more comfortable using computers later in life. 
So those are the two reasons, or the two examples to support the reason here. Now I might want to add another reason. So uh, computer games also build hand-eye coordination. Researchers at the University of Rochester discovered that game players have a better ability to spot things quickly. And uh, finally, that, that computer games can actually teach kids about history or um, about critical thinking. So games such as Sim City and Myst help kids build critical thinking skills, and games such as Age of Mythology inspire kids to learn more about history. So now, if you had all of these reasons, and you're like, Mom, Dad, you should buy me a computer game, these computer games teach kids valuable skills, they would help me learn typing, as well as get me interested in history, and oh, by the way, researchers at the University of Rochester have discovered that game players have a better ability to spot things quicker. Your parents might be a little bit more thinking, hmm, I wonder if buying a computer game for my kid is actually going to help them in life. Maybe. Now, when you're writing a persuasive, or your parents may just know you too well, uh, and not buy it for you, but when you're writing a persuasive essay, then you want to have it be pretty well organized and supported with details, and even when you're doing something like a narrative or a story, and you might think, well, you know, stories, they're not all that organized, it's still very similar. You want to organize your story. You want to have a beginning, middle, and an end, and you want to make sure that you have it organized and it's not just like going all over the place. So, for instance, for this persuasive example, then I'm using the idea of building an outline. So tip number two would be to build an outline. Now, the good thing is, is that when you're responding to state prompts, then you usually just have to write a couple of pages. You don't have to go all over the place, like this is, an, I was doing a research paper and I had to write a super long, super formal outline and that was, that took a while. So when you're doing your state test, you can do a very simple outline. That's basically saying what's going to happen in paragraph number one, paragraph number two, paragraph number three, four, five, however many paragraphs you have. So in this example, paragraph number one would be my introduction. So what do you do in your introduction? for a persuasive essay. Can you say it again just in case they weren't listening? Sure. What do you do when you have, you're writing a persuasive essay, what do you put in your first paragraph? What would you put? Levi, what would you put in your first paragraph? I, I would put, I would put capital letter, letters in my First paragraph. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. You, want, you definitely want capital letters. Uh, you always want to have capital letters at the beginning of every sentence. So, um, yeah, that's definitely good to keep aware of because they will grade you down if you have uh, any errors and stuff. But, um, what else? What else? Well, do you no, want? No. Uh, the main idea. The main idea. Yeah, exactly. When you, your introduction is all about here's what I'm, I'm saying. This is my main idea. Here are a couple reasons to support it and you're going to be expanding more on them later on. So you state the main idea of the essay and you introduce the reasons that support your main idea. So this would be the introduction for computer games. Computer games are educational, they teach kids visual skills and basic computer skills and encourage kids to think. So you see how with the encourage kids to think, I haven't gone and said, oh, they build critical thinking skills and they inspire us to learn about history. I haven't said that quite yet because I'm going to be talking about that in another paragraph. Paragraph number two, computers teach kids visual skills. And then I have the two examples. Paragraph three, computers help kids develop basic computer skills. And I have my two examples about typing. Computer games encourage kids to think. And I have my examples about critical thinking and history. And then paragraph five would be the conclusion, and that summarizes main points in new language. What does summarize mean? Yeah. Rain, what does summarize mean? Like, to put the passage in like your own words kind of, and kind of like brief. Yeah, and you would also, you might, um, it's a little bit different from taking the whole thing and repeating it over again. You might also, Give, uh, give a slightly shorter summary. So for instance, how would you summarize, um, let's see, what's the book what, that's everyone read? Uh, how would you summarize the first book of the Chronicles of Narnia? How would you summarize it? The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Who's read that, the first book? We've read it. Yeah. 
Nobody's read that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> it might be, yeah, you, it might, not everyone's, yeah, it might be a little bit, um, I reading a little Um, how about, okay, just summarize a book that you've read. Summarize a book you've read. You can yeah. summarize a book they've read. Colton. Um, Red Dog. It's about a, um, boy who has a dog, and, uh, <coughs> his dad goes off trapping. And then these guys come and help hold his mom and then captive. And um, he escapes and runs away from the guys and they run off after him. So, um, but when he gets back, his dad is coming. And um, the guy, the bad guy shot him. And the, but the package he was holding, um, it deflected the bullet. It was just really could you hear him? Yes, I did. Okay, so you summarized that book really well. Um, so now I know all what it's all about. Wow, that sounds like a pretty intense book. Um, so yeah, you, you summarized that. Now, when you think about the book, it was a whole lot longer than the summary that you gave. So when you summarize things, then you also you might squeeze it. So just like when you're telling a friend or someone you know, hey, I read this book recently. This is what it's about, and you summarize it. You're not like retelling the entire story. You're taking the most important things from the from the story, and you're using that to say, you know, here's what happened in the book. So at the conclusion you would summarize your reasons again in different language. So next time you are about to scold your kid for wasting time on the computer playing games, take a moment to consider what kind of skills you want him or her to develop. Might be a good ending line to sort of catch people's attention. So you see how you can easily, really easily build a persuasive essay or a persuasive response. You may think that sounds really scary, this whole persuasive essay stuff, but it's pretty simple. You just have your introduction, the main idea, you support your main idea with a bunch of reasons, and you support each reason with an example. It's sort of like building a house. You want to make sure it's supported well. So this is an example prompt. Actually, this is from a Tennessee state uh, writing assessment. This is a pretty common question on some state tests. Most students have a person they want to be like someday. Who is your role model? So this person said, who is your role model? Is a role model helps make models in the clay in art. What is a little bit off about this uh, response? What do you think of you? What's off, guys? Can you read it just one more time? Because it's kind of hard to see it on the sure, TV. Sure, yeah, and, and the handwriting is a little hard to read. Okay, so the, the, this is the prompt. Most students have a person they want to be like someday. Who is your role model? Write an essay telling who your role model is and explain why. Support your reasons with specific <coughs> examples and details. And then this is the response. Who is your role model? Is a role model helps make models into play in art. Okay, so she asked, what's wrong with that? Daddy, um, I don't really say what? Okay, so what's the problem with the response? Okay, she said the art part is the problem with the response. Well, that's partially true, because if you look at this, um, that's one part. There's a few different things that you can identify, but um, most students have a person they want to be like someday. Who is your role model? They don't quite understand the purpose here as far as a role model as in a person that you look up to, and they're saying that a role model is something you make clay out of in art, um, essentially is what they're saying. So what else could... What else is wrong with this response? Tell me. Um, <clears throat> uh, like, a role model, they don't like to name, because usually they like to list someone as your role model. I'm sorry? Did you hear him? He said that they didn't really put a name, that usually you would list somebody as your role model. Exactly. So, yeah, there's... For one thing, if you look at this, then it says, think about the qualities your role model has, why these are important to you, have specific examples and details, who is your role model. It doesn't answer any of those questions, and it's uh, one sentence that doesn't really make sense. Now this, on the other hand, which I know you can't see because it's, it's kind of small, but on the other hand, this one, uh, it goes like this. My mom opens a sliding door carefully and yells, girls, come inside. It is getting dark. Um, I have always looked up to my mom like she is a superhero and I want to be just like her when I get older. 
Who is your number one role model? This is a tough decision to make, but if you really think, it can be easy. I want to be just like my mom when I grow up because she puts family first, she cares about everyone, and she is an amazing cook. So, in this response, which is, you know, a top scoring one, when you see that she's using a hook, so she's using a little uh, quote at the beginning to sort of draw you in, make you interested, and then she says, I look up to my mom, and she doesn't just stop there, because you might think, okay, my role model, I look up to my mom, stop there. That wouldn't get a very uh, high response because they want you to include details. So she said, this is why I look up to my mom, all these reasons. And she lists her main idea, the fact that she looks up to her mom, and then she lists reasons to support it. And then she goes on to expand on those reasons in the next paragraph. <coughs> so the difference between this one and this one, aside from the fact that this one's handwriting is a little more uh, easy to read, is the fact that um, there's not errors, or there's not um, any sizable errors in this one. And there's also much more organization. They're answering the question, they're staying on topic, and they're providing details. So just by looking at examples of really good responses and really bad responses, then you see how what you're expected to do uh, when you're responding to a prompt. So remember, you want to understand the prompt's purpose and answer the question being asked with your response, because the person who was saying this, I'm not a role model in art, didn't, wasn't addressing the purpose of who your role model in life is. For instance, my superhero is my mom. Think about your audience. How much do you need to explain? So this person understood, you know, nobody who's judging her response would really know her mom necessarily, so she has to explain who her mom is. And then come up with supporting details or reasons to support your perspective or opinion. So, when you look at the in the first uh, minute when you're just reading the prompt, then you want to think, what is my purpose, who is my audience, what is my perspective? Now what happens if you, if you get a prompt, like for instance, my superhero is my mom, or sorry, if, who is your role model, or who is your superhero, and you think of someone, but then you can't really, you don't really know what to do next. What do you do when you can't think of what to write? Yeah. So what happens if you read the prompt and you know what you're supposed to be writing about, but you don't, you can't come up with things to do? What would you do, Courtney? What would you do? Well, just give information, information that you like about her and that is what is good about her. Yes, um, exactly. Let's if if you if you feel a little stuck on something, then you just ask yourself more questions. You'd 